I introduce to you our second keynote, Terry Gipps. Um, Terry is a nationally recognized sustainability leader, business consultant, agricultural econom econo sorry, economist, ecologist, natural step framework instructor, speaker and author of Breaking the Pesticide Habit and Humane Consumer and Producer Guide. He is the CEO of Sustainability Associates, which works with business, government, congregations, healthcare, academic institutions, and nonprofits to save money, improve performance, and become sustainability leaders. He is a University of Minnesota Center for Spirituality and Healing collaborator, president of the Alliance for Sustainability, and member of the City of St. Louis Park Environment and Sustainability Commission. Previously, he worked as a White House assistant aide to U.S. representatives Abner Mikva and John Krebs. He's as adjunct faculty at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, executive director of the International Alliance for Sustainability, I'm sorry, Sustainable Agriculture, and co-founder of the Sacramento Community Garden Program of the University of California Cooperative Extension. He graduated from Claremont McKenna College and completed his MS in Agricultural and Applied Economics at the University of California, Davis, and a Master's in Public and Private Management from Yale. Terry served as a founding vice chair of Congregations Caring for Creation and is a founding board member of the Coalition on Environment and Jewish Life, the National Umbrella Jewish Environmental Group. He is a longtime board member of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas and is a member of Temple Israel's Property Committee and Nir Tamid Task Force for Sustainability. He is also the co-founder and leader of the Twin Cities Jewish Renewal Community. Um, for us, this is the third time Terry has spoken with our, our group and we are so happy to have him back. So please offer a warm welcome to Terry Gibbs. It is uh, just so special to be back with all of you. Um, I just, uh, every time I come here, I always learn so much uh, from you, and I just am really grateful. And I take what you're doing here in Michigan, and I share it back in Minnesota to inspire others. So this conference has done the same again. So I'm newly energized, and I'm going to take back all the great things you're doing. And we would like to be a model. And, and I've told some of you that I wouldn't mind moving to Michigan just so I can be involved in Michigan Interfaith Power and Light. So uh, that's it's a great, great group, and I just really appreciate it. Uh, the talk I'm going to do could be called Show Me the Money, Practical Steps to Sustainability uh, with the Natural Step Framework. I want to bring you greetings from Lake Wobegon, where I come from, uh, where, you know, all of the children, um, well, I, I will say, all, all of the, um, the women uh, are strong. Uh, the men are very, very sensitive, and the children are all committed to sustainability. So we're, we're doing our best there, but we still have a little ways to go. I want to say special thanks uh, at the very beginning to Michigan Interfaith Power and Light uh, for nine years of doing this conference. I just think it's amazing, and congratulations on the 10th anniversary, great leadership uh, by Julie. And I just, I just think it's really a wonderful model organization, and I, it's just so inspiring. And I also, I'm, I'm so glad to be here at Lawrence Technological University. My very first time here, very, very impressive to hear about the programs and everything that you have been doing, and that you're, you also have been doing the conference for nine years, so that's impressive. A uh, special thank you to the sponsors and exhibitors, because um, just my spending time with groups like uh, Veg Michigan and some of the others, I've learned a lot just in talking to the various exhibitors. And I think one of my favorite exhibits that I just really, really loved was in the very back, I don't know if he's here, but where they actually found out that they could do insulation material 
for people's homes in developing countries with plastic, discarded plastic bags that provided the same equivalent amount of insulation as regular insulation material. And that just really blew my mind. So I, I was very grateful you know, to each of you that I had a chance to talk with. The speakers, I learned so much from each one of you. I particularly appreciated the one in this last uh, room where we were talking about how we take sustainability to scale and what we need to do that. Just a great group of speakers. And really to all of you for taking time from your lives to be here because you care so much. But I want to say a special and do a special acknowledgement about Janice. Where's Janice? Is she here? Hope she's here. Well, she may be doing something out there. So uh, what I wanted to say about Janice is I heard her interview. There was a cable TV uh, crew here and, and they interviewed her. And it was just interesting to hear how 10 years ago when she first came here, there wasn't a sustainability program. And in one year she had the first SOS uh, at conference or meeting um, uh, presentation, and now how sustainability is actually being interwoven into all of the different departments here at the university. That really says a lot about the difference one person can make by working with other people in a really, really positive way. And I hope, I think it's really a great model for what else. But I do know someone who, al who also has made a huge difference, and that's Father Charles Morris. Charles, you're over here, hold your hand up. Just because Charles, <laughs> You, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting that we, we talk about heroes, and Maya Angela came up with the term she rose. And we talk about the heroes and she rose. And I have to say, Janice is now one of my new she rose, and Charles has been one of my longtime heroes. Because really, he has shown the difference that one person also can make by working in a really positive, collaborative way with a whole range of different people to help make this all happen. So thanks for your vision, for your leadership. It's really extraordinary. But I'm not going to end there, because what I also want to do is to acknowledge all of you. because. If you look around in this room right now, you're gonna see a whole lot of other heroes and sheroes. Each one of you is really making a difference, whether it's in your church or in your um, uh, academic work or in your business, whatever it is. I just really appreciate your commitment and what you're doing to help bring about sustainability in the world. So here is my required uh, statement. <laughs> I think you've seen it a few times, so I will skip over that. Um, a great philosopher named Woody Allen once said, more than any time in history, humankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Thank you, Woody. <laughs> Fortunately, there is a third path, and that's what this conference has been all about. That's the path of sustainability. Now, Buckminster Fuller, I think, asked perhaps the most important question I have ever seen anybody ever ask. He said, how do we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological damage or disadvantage to anyone? Huge question. And I think it's really the question of our time. And I think that's why it's so important that we have this conference, this opportunity to actually talk and think about how we can bring about this kind of shift. The good news is I'm hoping that in the short time I have with you, I can show you how we can actually accomplish that. I don't think it's hard, and I want to show you how we can do that. Now, because we're at an academic institution, I wanted to just sort of take this quote because I think it's a really great question. What if higher education were to take a leadership role in preparing students and providing the information, knowledge, and skills to achieve a healthy, just, and sustainable society? What would higher education look like? And I think that's a huge question, and I hope that that's a question that can really inform what you do here at the university. So today, in terms of learning objectives, what I hope we can do are four things. First, understand the challenges that we face, what sustainability is, and the opportunities it offers. Comprehend the natural step is a widely used, scientifically-based framework 
for saving money and achieving sustainability. Third, to be able to see how this powerful ABCD process that I'll share with you, awareness of sustainability, baseline assessment, creating a sustainability vision, and developing a sustainability action plan can be used by each one of you, whether it's in your home, in your workplace, in the community, whatever institution you're involved in. It's a very simple, very fast process for really bringing a shift to sustainability. And last, I'd like to share some practical examples that are easily, immediately implementable and document the cost and energy savings along with the other benefits. Does that sound okay? Those four goals. So, as far as an agenda, I'd like to begin by sharing some good news about our home, Spaceship Earth. Second, to talk about just briefly what is sustainability so we have that shared understanding. Third, to look at how do we climb this mountain that's higher than Mount Everest, which we call Mount Sustainability, uh, using this simple ABCD process that I mentioned. Fourth, to look at the natural step. Where does it come from, its purpose? Who's using it? Uh, and then actions that you can take right now based on the four principles of the natural step framework and open up to any questions and discussion. So let me ask. Would it be helpful if we could have an approach that would do these things? First, save money, time, and our health. Second, improve overall performance. Third, to shift from problem solving to vision and breakthrough solutions. To align our values with our practices. To overcome the various divisions, political and other types of divisions that we have in our society if it could be used by the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, so it could be spread everywhere. If it could inspire and engage the entire community. And last, if we could address all aspects of sustainability in one simple effort, would that be a useful tool, useful approach? Because that's what I think the natural stuff actually does. And I've seen, seen it in all kinds of public, private, and nonprofit settings do just that. I think the idea of the natural step is well summarized by this beautiful poem by a woman named Marcy Hands. Fueled by a million man-made wings of fire, the rocket tore a tunnel through the sky and everybody cheered. <clears throat> Fueled only by a thought from God, the seedling urged its way through the thickness of black and as it pierced the heavy ceiling of the soil up into outer space, no one even clapped. So this whole idea, uh, how we focus on rockets and high technology, but so often we don't appreciate the miracle that happens every day of the seedling urging itself up through the thickness of black, up into outer space. And it's that miracle that allowed us to have the wonderful lunch that we did, to have the clothes we have, to have a warmer, cool building. So I'd like to take a look at how does that actually work? The place we want to begin is with our home, Mother Earth, Spaceship Earth. And you know, every astronaut that's ever gone up into outer space has said it was a transformational experience to look back on our planet and to see it as one whole interconnected ecosystem with no political boundaries whatsoever. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell said, my view of our planet was a glimpse of divinity. German astronaut Sigmund Jahn said, before I flew I was already aware of how small and vulnerable our planet is, but only when I saw it from space, in all its ineffable beauty and fragility, did I realize that humankind's most urgent task is to cherish and preserve it for future generations. So today what I'd like to do is just, just to share a little bit different perspective on our planet. The idea being that if we have a different perspective, we might get some new insights in terms of what's actually going on on the planet and what we can do about it. Does anybody see anything unusual about this perspective on our planet? I see a nod or two. What do you see that's different? What's that? Upside down, exactly. This is the most reproduced picture in the history of the world. And I just took it and I flipped it 180 degrees 
so we can look at our planet from a new perspective and hopefully get some new insights in terms of what's actually going on on our planet. Einstein said that the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we used when we created them. In other words, we have to think outside the box. Oops. So here's a cartoon. A uh, guy's talking to his cat and he says, never ever think outside the box. So I want you guys to think outside the box today, okay? Now, Nobel Prize winning physicist Max Planck said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. This is so huge because how we hold what's going on, the challenges that we're facing, how we hold ourselves, all of that becomes really important. So sustainability isn't just about an external thing, it also is about us and about how we hold who we are. Now, when I was young, I always used to want to be an astronaut. Uh, there was a little boy I grew up, uh, John Grunsfeld, and he and I used to practice being astronauts, getting boosted into outer space. And I'm just curious, did anybody here ever want to be an astronaut? I want to see hands. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, nine of us wanted to be an astronaut. If you were watching television maybe five years ago, this is the picture you would have seen. The little boy that I grew up with, John Grunsfeld, had in fact become an astronaut. And this is a picture of him walking in outer space. Our dreams can become a reality, and that's actually what happened to him. But I have some good news for the nine of us that wanted to be astronauts, and that is all of all nine of us, actually our dream has come true. This is our spaceship. But I have bad news for the rest of you. You're astronauts too. You're all on board this spaceship Earth. Um, each day, the food we eat, the work we do, the vehicle we drive, all the things are impacting our home, spaceship Earth. There's a big difference though between us and people like astronauts like John Grunsfeld. Nobody ever trained us how to operate Spaceship Earth. They didn't give us a driver's ed class, they didn't give us an operating manual like John Grunsfeld had, or study for years how the thing operated. So what's the result? Well, we've got lots of challenges on board our spaceship. But what I want to do is to share something environmentalists never talk about. Four great things about the design of our planet. Four wonderful things that I think are really quite transformative and are important for us all to understand. So the first is that our planet has an extraordinary design. It's actually designed to get cleaner, purer, more abundant, and more diverse all on its own. That's because of a process called the natural step, uh, I'm sorry, the natural cycle, which I'm not gonna have a chance to go into because of time today, but a very powerful process. Second piece of good news is there is no shortage of energy on our planet. We have far more energy than we are ever going to be able to use. Um, if, you take, if you look at all of the solar energy that reaches our planet, um, we get 13,000 times more solar energy than is used by our global society, 13,000 times. And in fact, just one hour of sun striking our planet provides more than enough energy to run everything on our planet for one year. One hour, one year. We don't have an energy shortage. A third thing is we uh, have an abundance of materials. We always talk about how we're going to run out, we're going to run out. But actually, in fact, other than some rare metals and minerals, we have huge amounts of resources. That is really not what the challenge is. If we need to use the resources well, that's for sure. Even with something like petroleum, we're not about to run out of petroleum. As we found with natural gas, there's more and more that we continue to find. The problem, again, is not so much running out, is that the pollution that those resources cause in the very thin biosphere that we have on this planet, where these materials will last for a million years. And finally, Good news, it's not bad to be a human being. 
We actually are meant to be, we're part of the natural cycle on the planet. So we have those four good pieces of news. So what's the challenge? The challenge is, is that over the last 200 years, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been doing things that have been violating the operating rules of our home. We didn't know what the operating rules were. We weren't trying to violate them. But we've been violating the operating rules of Spaceship Earth. And the challenge is that if we stay on our present path, we will create conditions that will no longer allow human beings to keep living on the planet. Life will go on on the planet, but it will be minus us and thousands and thousands of other, thousands and thousands of other species. So we sort of have a vested interest to find out what are the operating rules on spaceship Earth. So good news is there are just four operating rules that we have to follow. If we follow these four rules, we can have a healthy, sustainable present for us and assure a healthy, sustainable future for our children and their children into the future. But the deal is we have to follow all four rules. Now you happen to have an extraordinary baseball team, and the deal with your team is if a batter hits three for four, they have a 750 batting average, they're the greatest player of all time. Some of your guys are close. But in this game, they're out. You gotta do all four of these rules. You have to bat a thousand. So I wanna share what the four rules are that we need to follow to bring about sustainability. And I wanna show you why I don't think it's hard for us to accomplish all four. So the first is, and these are based on the principles of the natural step, the first is the idea that we have to limit what we take from the earth. Specifically, we have to minimize our mining of metals and minerals from the earth and the burning of fossil fuels. So the question is, can we do that? And I think very simply, we can. Simple things like recycling or take back of electronic uh, uh, goods. Um, alternative forms of transportation, using renewable energy. We can do this. And I think the conference has really demonstrated how that's possible. The second principle is to avoid toxic substances that we make. So here we need to find alternatives to hazardous pesticides and chemicals and plastics. Can we do this? Well, absolutely. Purchasing organic food, natural cleaning products, natural personal care products. We can do this. The third is that we have to respect to the earth. We need to protect biodiversity, uh, ecosystems, natural resources. Can we do this? Absolutely. Simple things like purchasing 100% post-consumer recycled paper, composting, protecting watersheds and wetlands, saving water. So we can accomplish this. But I want to get on to the fourth because the fourth is a huge one. The fourth, I believe, is our biggest challenge. And that is, we need to meet fundamental human needs. We have to remove the barriers to people being able to meet these needs. This is a huge, huge challenge. I want to show you how I think we can do it, and to actually do it very quickly at the end of the presentation. But there's some simple steps that we can take, like community gardens, promoting health and wellness programs, purchasing fair trade products, invest socially responsible investing, some simple things that we can do that can make a huge difference. So my feeling is that if we can follow these four principles, we can have a healthy, sustainable present and future. At the same time, we can have a four to 100 fold increase in productivity, like the Industrial Revolution. We can have huge money savings. We can create jobs, have livable communities, actually reduce taxes. This is not a bad thing. I believe that this is the greatest opportunity human beings have ever had on this planet. This is a choice that we can make today that will have huge impacts in a positive way moving forward. And in fact, my belief is that we can fundamentally transform life in a positive way on this planet. We don't need to wait generations and generations for this to be able to happen. In fact, I believe we can start this transformation in five to 10 years. And that's why this conference and the work each of you is doing is so important to bringing this about. As Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world 
Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And as Arnhadi Roy said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. <coughs> so let's just talk briefly about sustainability. The roots of sustainability, um, you know, it's interesting. In every different spiritual tradition, as you heard in the last workshop, but in every tradition, there are phenomenal teachings about sustainability. We didn't call it that, but that's what its roots were. And I just want to just briefly touch on a few. So in the Bible, you can find this wonderful, uh, beautiful statement from Ecclesiastes. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns about to the north. It whirls about continuously. And the wind returns again according to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place where the rivers come, they return again. The thing that has been is what, is what shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. An amazing understanding of sustainability, about the interconnectedness of all life. Now, they didn't have PhDs, but they totally got it, and it's right there in the Bible. Native American proverb, that the frog does not drink up the pond in which it lives. Or the concept of the seventh generation. In every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decision on the next seven generations. That moves us into sort of a sustainability consciousness. And according to Jewish teachings by those who helped to write the Talmud, God brought Adam to the Garden of Eden and said, behold my works, you know, see how beautiful they are, and showed Adam all this great work that God had created. But then God warned Adam, see to it that you do not corrupt and destroy my world, for if you do, there will be no one to repair it after you. So it's up to us to become the stewards of this gift that we have been given. And if we screw it up, there's no superman or superwoman that's gonna come in and fix it. That's what our work is about, caring for creation. So when it comes to definitions of sustainability, I always like to say that I don't think there's any best definition. I think each definition sort of has a different essence about sustainability. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but I do want to just share three of the most widely used definitions. The first is one that we developed at the Alliance for Sustainability, that sustainability has four parts. To achieve sustainability, the system must be ecologically sound, economically viable, socially just, and humane, meaning to embody our highest values, how we treat people, animals, and the earth. That we need all four, it's like a chair that you're sitting on. You need all four legs to have sustainability. The most widely used definition comes from the UN, that sustainable development or sustainability meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And so making sure that there will be the ability of future generations to meet their needs, and we're not just talking about people, but all life on the planet. And then the last definition actually comes from the world of business. If I ask you, what's the real bottom line for business, what would you tell me? Profit? Yeah, exactly. But is that the real bottom line? I mean, how about how your employees are doing? How about your customers? How about your suppliers? How about the community where you live and operate? So more and more, what we're talking about is a triple bottom line, which is the name of this conference, about the social, environmental, financial aspects. Sometimes we call this the three Ps for people, planet, profits. Sometimes we call it the three E's for equity, ecology, economy. It doesn't really matter what you want to call it. But this is not a little thing. If you have a business in Europe today, this is how you're operating your business. If you have a business in the United States, you go, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? So this is a huge positive shift, and that's why I wanted to talk about sustainability briefly, because this is something that each one of us, everybody in this room, needs to be able to talk about. Whichever definition doesn't matter, but we have to be able to communicate what it is we want. If we do, I believe people will say yes. This is a positive, positive statement, and it's something I think people want. In the end, I don't think sustainability is special. I think sustainability is just common sense. I do a lot of work in extremely conservative communities and with extremely conservative businesses. 
And almost always, if I really talk to people, they'll say, oh, it's about conserving things. And I go, ah, very good. Exactly. So I think how we language things, how we frame things, becomes very, very important. And this really is something that's just so common sense. In the future, we probably won't even need a term sustainability because it's going to be integrated into everything that we do. It just makes sense that you're going to treat people well, care for your resources, and for the planet. I had a vision about sustainability. And the vision was that sustainability was like a circle. And sustainability was on the inside of the circle. And on the outside of the circle were all kinds of doorways. And each doorway had an entrance sign. And there were hundreds of them. Here are just a few. Social justice, architecture, spirituality, business, environment, exercise, art, health. And there are many more. I think it's our job to create a doorway with an entrance sign that welcomes every single person into this world that we're here in of sustainability. So everybody feels comfortable entering in. And once they're inside, they'll see the interconnections between all the different things that we've been talking about here at this conference. And that none of us are at true sustainability. All of us can take some next steps. And in fact, we can't get to sustainability without all of us moving towards sustainability together. I cannot emphasize enough about sustainability being profitable. I have a little exercise I'd normally like to do, but I think because of time, I won't do it. But I'm going to demonstrate it through some of the slides that I'll share with you. This is one that's just really huge, and it's something that I think everybody needs to know about. This is a recent study by Harvard Business School. And they looked at the impact of having a sustainability culture on a business. So what they did is they, they looked at um, uh, 180 companies, 90 matched companies in industries. And they um, wanted to see how was their performance. And this is the conclusion that they came to. Corporations that voluntarily adopted social and environmental policies many years ago, which they call high sustainability, significantly outperform their counterparts over the long term in terms of stock market performance and accounting performance. Across the board, this is a very, very important study that quantifies the benefits of making a commitment to sustainability. I don't think it applies just to business. I think it applies to any kind of institution. It makes a huge, huge difference. So any questions about what I've shared about sustainability, any of that overall so far? Questions? Yes? I'm a firm believer that magnitude matters. So when I look at, let's say, three or four points, and one of them was reduce the impact of mining and fossil fuel consumption and yeah. production. That's a huge economic function of the gross domestic yes. product. But when I look at something like um, start up um, fair trade coffee and community gardens, that's a minuscule amount of economic activity. So my question is, if you're going to meet the uh, objective of Buckminster Fuller, how do you take all these people who are, pr are exploiting, pr producing, mining, et cetera, and say, now we need to go back to the green collar jobs? Yeah, I, th I think, could you hear, like, how do we take this to scale? And what do we do when you're talking about something as large as an extractive industry like mining, which has huge impacts relative to maybe fair trade something or, or whatever at this point anyway? So I think that that's a great question. One of the things that we always try to do, I think, in sustainability is actually look at what is, it, what is the service that they're providing? What is it that they're doing? And in a sustainable society, what would that look like? And I think one of the very important things in the case of mining, or because I've had to work with companies like Sunoco, you know, an oil company, so what do you do? So I always begin with that question of what is the service that they're providing? In the case of a mining company, one of the things is they are very good at managing and processing materials, right? They're very good at that. Great logistics, all of that kind of thing. So how about all of the metals and minerals that we've already extracted that are in our landfills? Can we create operations to use those landfills and actually re-extract those metals that we don't want going into our groundwater. So 
is there a possibility for being able to do that? There are a number of companies that are really committed to sustainability in that space. The same thing with a petroleum company. Um, with Sun Oil, I asked them the question, well, your name is about the sun. So is there a way, what your, in business, is, what your business is about is about transportation, about being able to move people. Do you need to move people with fossil fuel? Or can there be other ways of moving people? And the answer is obviously yes. We're seeing it with electric vehicles and with alternative fuel vehicles and that kind of thing. So can they start moving into these other spaces? And there are examples in Sweden where the largest petroleum company in Sweden actually made that change to farmer-grown biofuels, not corn-based biofuels, but to farmer-grown biofuels and is now a leader in sustainability, actually lobbying the government to have higher air quality standards, not lower. So I think that there are opportunities. It's difficult. It's really difficult with many of these industries. But I think we're starting to see leaders. And I'm going to show you a great leader in the petroleum industry, Ray Anderson with Interface, who had a tremendously polluting industry, um, you know, horrible. And I'll show you sort of what he did to transform his industry. But I think it's a great question. And it's not an easy answer. I don't want to make that out to be easy. That's a tough one, that transformation. Any other questions for moving on? Yeah. Here, let me just get the mic. Um, you know, I've heard from people, I think they know what they're talking about, you know, in the, like the Michigan Department of Agriculture, that, and others, um, like an NPR, I think, but, the, um, you know, the supply of mineral phosphate for making uh, fertilizer, they say there's only a 30-year supply left. Yeah. And that's a chemical element. You can't manufacture that stuff. Yeah. So well, you talk about not running out of minerals, but yeah. they say we're running out of that mineral, and that one we can't live without, literally. Yeah. Well, I think it's a question from an, you know, from an organic and sustainability standpoint about just sort of the mining of, you know, well, I'm sorry. You know, you can try to close the loop as best you can, but the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, says that some of that's going to keep getting away. Yeah. No, I, 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 no doubt it's a problem, but I think that there are other ways that you can, having more organic matter in the soil actually helps to maintain it and keep it, which is really, the far, organic farmers are not applying it in any of those forms. So I think, you know, I, I, there, I don't want to say that there aren't any challenges in terms of some resources. There are some, but I think that in many cases there actually are very good alternatives. One last one. Another question. Yeah, another. Where, where does the phosphorus come from? that the organic farmers are applying to their land. It had to come from someplace. Yeah. And it, it came from somebody who was using mineral phosphate, probably. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I don't want to belabor the question, but, but there are great organic sources of phosphate that were not mined. And the mo phosphate mining around the world is really one of the most polluting industries there is. I mean, it's really a problematic. So I would like to see a shift to other you know, sources. But we can talk more about it after. I want to. So is that OK? So we'll go on and. Great, great points. So the question is, as I think you well pointed out with your scale question, here is Mount Everest, high, daunting. A peak that's higher than Mount Everest is what we call Mount Sustainability. It is even more daunting for most of us to imagine how we're going to change a society in these kinds of ways that you've referenced to sustainability. And so how do we do this? What's the process? So I want to share about this ABCD process that we use, because I think this is such a simple tool. And you can use this in your home, in your workplace, or in the community very, very effectively. So I think there are three common ways that people go about approaching sustainability. One is what I call the list approach. 101 things you can do to save the planet, right? So I want to ask, have any of you done all 101? Anybody here? Yeah, I got one. No, close. He was sort of on the line, maybe 99, right? <laughs> um, yeah, most of us don't respond too well to a list approach. We don't like a top-down kind of thing. That's just how people are. So I don't find that those approaches are very effective. A second approach is the audit approach. That's what I do for a living. I go around to various institutions, and I do eco-audits of those institutions. How are they doing? You have to pay me a lot of money, and I do a whole report. And what do I do? 
I give you a list of all the things that you need to do. So don't use my services. <laughs> so I don't think that's very effective either. But the third approach is to have an engaging process that engages everybody in the institution. I have found that this is so powerful and so effective. It's really transformational. People own it. People make commitments. It changes their lives. So for your congregation, your university, your business, whatever kind of institution you're in, I'd like to suggest that. And I'll just share the process that we use with the natural step. We call it the ABCD process. Here we have Mount Sustainability, this peak up here. And here's where we begin, way down here at the bottom of the mountain. And the place we always begin is with an awareness of sustainability. What is sustainability? And for that, we use these four principles of the natural step to guide us. So we have an understanding. What's our North Star? What are we trying to accomplish? People need to understand not just all about the bad things that are happening, because I really spend very little time talking about the bad, but what are the opportunities? In marketing, we talk about what's in it for me. With them. You got to talk to people. And they have to understand that sustainability is actually going to save them money, save them time, give them a healthier life, create the kind of world that they actually want to live in. And that message is going to be different for each person. If they hunt, or they fish, or their grandparents, or whatever it is, if they have breast cancer, whatever that is, it's got to be tailored to that person and the things that matter for them. And that's what the natural step does, and it gives people a message that we literally can turn things around. That also is important, to have a positive message that we can make a difference by working together. And I'll show you some large-scale examples of how that is possible. So this is the place we always feel is essential to begin. And any time I'm called into any business, any government, any university, and things have not been working, they've been doing a sustainability program, and they haven't been able to get there, I almost always will hear that they didn't do this step that people did not have this shared understanding, almost always. So it's very important. The B is doing a baseline assessment. Where are we today at this university, in my congregation, in my business, in terms of sustainability? And this is not a big, it doesn't have to be a big quantitative analysis. But people have a pretty good sense, once they understand these four principles, of how are we doing in terms of meeting all four of the principles. Where are we really strong? Where do we have some work to do? So that assessment becomes very helpful. So the next question is, so where do we go from there? <clears throat> well, what most people do is they start climbing. And you know, they, they do a program here. Oh, we've got a recycling program, and we did some energy conservation. We did an audit. We did some lighting. We, we've done you know, a wind, uh, uh, we're part of a wind farm or solar panels. And they get to about here, and they stall out. So how do we get to the mountaintop? How do we get there? And this is, I think, the brilliance of this very simple ABCD process. Well, I, I forgot before going there, just so you can see the baseline assessment. This is just a little tool that we use. Um, and just some of the examples of some of the things in terms of your, where you're aligned and where you're not aligned. So how do we get there? We do the C. We create a vision of sustainability. In other words, we go to the mountaintop. What would it look like if our institution were completely sustainable? What does that mean? That means that we meet all four of these principles of sustainability. Now that may be 10 years, 20, 30 years into the future. But this becomes really important. It's transformational when people understand and can feel and can see their lives, their institution, their home, being fully sustainable. It changes the way they see their work. Their work is not normal work anymore. It's not just that they get paid, but they're creating the kind of world that they want to live in, that they want for their kids. This becomes so important. And I'll tell you, you know how long it takes to do a vision? with a group, <laughs> we can do them in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. This does not have to be a big process that's hard and difficult. No, not at all. 
You can do it very, very quickly. This visioning process becomes extremely important. Um, I love this, what uh, Dr. Stuart Hart said, really one of the great sustainability uh, professors. He said, a vision of sustainability for an industry or a company is like a roadmap to the future, showing the way products and services must evolve and what new competencies will be needed to get there. Pretty strong words about the importance of a vision. <coughs> Few companies today have such a road map. So, no wonder we're in the situation we're in. People don't have that road map. They don't have that vision. And I love what Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said. If you want to build a ship, don't herd people together to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work. But rather, teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. That's really our job to turn people on to this possibility of what we can create. That becomes so important. And I love this. Um, it's a little hard to read. It says, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. That's what you can create, what you cannot see, what we're not experiencing today. That's the importance of having a vision, is allowing that to become created. And so you can brainstorm your future. And here's just a few of the items, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's very simple. It's not hard. What would it be like? What would it feel like to go to work every day or to come home if it were totally sustainable? This is so important. It's like Martin Luther King going to the mountaintop, seeing the promised land. It becomes really important for us to see that. And finally, we're now at the mountaintop. How do we get back down from up there to where we are today? We call that reverse engineering or backcasting. What are the steps we need to take from that vision to get back where we are today? It is so easy to do an action plan once people have a vision. It's really not hard at all. All the things that were really hard going up, all of a sudden when you're coming down from the mountaintop, People come together and say, oh yeah, we can do that. That's not hard to do. It's amazing transformation just by making that change. So think about using that. So get key strategic actions into practical plan with a time frame, responsibilities, steps for measuring, and do the right training, organizational learning, and change techniques. Um, and, and here's just a few of the items that some groups have come up with when they're developing their action plans. It's very inspiring. Five minutes, oh my goodness, all right. So I'll just, I'm, I'm not gonna spend time on this other than to say there's a big difference between doing green projects versus being a sustainable institution. Doing one-off projects does not have the same effect, and I've heard that from many of the speakers about your home. Doing one thing will not have the effect of optimizing, so it becomes very important in doing a whole systems approach. So, in, I won't take questions now. Uh, I want to say that there are a lot of tools that one can use for achieving sustainability. These are just a few of the tools that you can use, uh, and there are lots of them. I have found that one of the most powerful ones is this one, the Natural Step Framework, whose purpose is to develop and share a common framework comprised of easily understood, scientifically based principles that can serve as a compass to guide society toward a just and sustainable future. It was founded by this man, Dr. Carl Henrik Romare, uh, a medical, an oncologist, medical doctor, um, and um, it was created in 1989 in Sweden. Uh, it's now being used around the world by all kinds of companies. IKEA was the first company to use it, um, and many, many companies have been using it, and here are just a few, I won't even spend time uh, listing them all, but it's not just businesses, you know, like Electrolux and Interface, but it's also uh, municipalities, lots of cities, lots of congregations that I have had the privilege of working with, healthcare institutions, universities, all times, types of institutions have used it. So, I want to give some practical examples. I promised I would do that and show you how we can save money by being more environmentally and socially responsible. So this first principle, what we take from the earth. So here we're talking about mining of metals and minerals and burning of fossil fuels. Um, well, simply we need to use renewable energy and non-toxic reusable materials to avoid the spread of hazardous levels of pollutants and mined metals and minerals. 
I have a checklist that's available in the back of the room on both sides, so please feel free to take it. On the other side are 10 things you can do to save money and the earth. So um, please take that. And we've got one for businesses as well online. So if you'd like to get any of them online, please take them. So simple things, recycling. You know, at the present time, we recycle only about half the aluminum cans in this country. Only about half. That's outrageous. We throw away enough aluminum cans in this country to rebuild the entire US commercial air fleet every three months. That is unacceptable and totally not sustainable. And here's a stunning thing. If we did all of the recycling and all of the composting that we could, get this, we could save so much energy by doing that, we could get rid of 21% of all of the coal-fired power plants in this country. 21% just by recycling and composting. This is not hard to do at all. A uh, little cartoon from a Japanese uh, sustainability professor. Uh, there's a picture of Santa saying, Dear Santa, or from the boy saying, there, These are toys I no longer use. Please give them uh, to children who will make use of them. And so the idea of reusing our materials and sharing them again and again. I promised I'd show you some ways to save a lot of money very quickly. Two rechargeable batteries charged over and over will save you about $1,000 over their life. Two batteries costing you six dollars will save you a thousand dollars and perform just as well if not better. Simple things like just turning off light switches, which I still am working on my daughter who's 15 to do, not always an easy thing to do behavior change. Uh, Energy Star, I won't say more than it's a very important simple tool that you can use. Uh, LEDs, I, I do want to disagree with a previous speaker uh, with some of the comments, the negative comments. I think that there are some challenges with LEDs with certain manufacturers. I can't say about some of the manufacturers that I do think make great LEDs, but they can save you one bulb, one incandescent bulb changed over to an LED can save you $557 over its useful life. And some of the things that he said I thought were really unfortunate in terms of dissing uh, what's going on with LEDs because I've seen them for outdoor, indoor, replacement of fluorescent tube lighting, uh, and you get tremendous paybacks anywhere from six months to three years, uh, depending on the amount of um, how long it's on. Simple actions that you can do, obviously, turning off lights and equipment, like a computer will save you $120 a year, setting back thermostats, 2% on air conditioning costs, per degree raised, HVAC, uh, huge savings, and obviously energy efficient lighting. Uh, solar panels that we put on at my synagogue in Minnesota, uh, at Temple Israel, uh, lowered our electricity bill 50 to to $100 a year. The payback, however, when we first put them in a long time ago, actually was not so great, 20 to 40 years. That's now changing dramatically uh, thanks to some of the new financing uh, that's available. Purchasing green energy, uh, having a, a bike. A bike is the most efficient machine in the world. It's a phenomenal way to, to move. Uh, this is one of my bikes, an electric bike. can go 20 to 30 miles on a single charge. You can wear a suit or a dress, do all of your shopping and go 20 miles an hour even into the wind. So it's a great way to go. Eco-driving, very simple thing they teach people in Sweden. You do three things, properly inflate your tires, avoid sudden stops and starts, drive the speed limit, will save you 25% or more on your fuel costs. Right away, simple, you don't need a hybrid to be able to have that kind of savings right away. Uh, this is Sangasabe, a conference center in Sweden. It's the world's most environmental conference center where everybody was trained on the natural step framework. Can all tell you about specific things that they have done. It's completely fossil fuel free. No fossil fuels are used whatsoever. They converted their conventional farm to a model organic farm. They serve organic food and they have certified sustainable forestry. What I like about it though, <coughs> is that these aren't nice concepts. They developed indicators. So you can measure your, pro your progress quantitatively. Um, very simply, for example, you can look at how many environmental vehicles you have, or you can look at your sewage sludge and what's going on in terms of heavy metals like mercury. 
And it can all be summed up in a simple summary report where you can see green is going the right direction, uh, yellow staying the same, red the wrong direction, and the recycling symbol, you achieved your goal. So somebody in just one minute's time can see how are we doing. Um, solar tubes, um, one of my clients, White Bear Racken and Swim, now Lifetime Fitness, put in solar tubes where the lights are not turned on during the day, that's natural daylight you see, six to seven year payback, extends the life of the bulb by twice, decreases air conditioning significantly, decreased peak demand load, saves time because you don't have to replace them as often, but the big deal is increased productivity. Uh, increased retail sales, and this has been demonstrated in a quantitative way in so many um, cases. Um, at, they ha also have a tennis uh, area. They, instead of building another bubble, they put in a highly insulated building with super efficient indirect lighting and in-court radiant heat and cooling um, from ground source heat pumps. What was the result? They're saving about $40,000 a year with a two-year payback, but it increased their tennis, tennis revenue by $246,000 a year because it's the best place to play tennis anywhere. It's much quieter, much better lighting, much better, more even temperatures, and as a result is their membership went up $112,000. So a win, 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 win across the board from making a commitment to sustainability. One of the churches that I've worked with <coughs> where we did a $2.7 million building renovation, St. Joan of Arc Church in Minneapolis, um, looking at just all the different aspects. I think just because of time, I won't mention it, but I just want to point out, these do not have to be complex changes. These are simple changes that can be made. Uh, reduced electricity, 100% daylighting with a narrow floor plate, uh, reduced heating and cooling, shading for west windows, uh, energy efficient operable windows, um, just, it doesn't have to be rocket science. It can be some very simple, good building practices. Um, as far as universities are concerned, this was one of the first universities, the University of Texas at Houston, that used the natural step. They've saved huge amounts of money. They built a lead gold $57 million nursing building uh, based on the natural step. Um, again, I think just because of time I won't go into, but 77% of the materials are recycled or reused. 75% of building construction waste was salvaged or recycled. Uh, huge energy savings, 80% less energy per square foot than their other existing building. Um, daylit, dimmable windows, operable windows. These are, I think, becoming pretty standard practices. So they were at the cutting edge when it was first built. The city of Santa Monica was the first city in the U.S. to use the natural step. Um, they were, as a result of that, they were the first city to choose 100% renewable energy. They re, while everybody else's greenhouse gas emissions were going up, they actually reduced theirs um, by 6% uh, in 10 years. Everybody else going up, they're reducing theirs. And this is their new icon, their new statement to the world, the world's first solar-powered Ferris wheel. And it's a statement about who they are and what they want to be. It's an amazing thing to see. So uh, where am I time-wise? Am I done? Or? All right, I'll take one more minute. I'm not sure which one to talk about. Second principle, uh, I'll just say non-toxic cleaning products, they perform just as well, if not better. You can make your own for 50 cents and save a lot of money. They're excellent products, but great studies show they clean just as well, if not better. Um, this is one of the companies I've worked with, Tenant, and they asked the question, what if we made plain tap water into a powerful detergent by electrically activating it? And so the result is this machine that is taking over the world in terms of cleaning. This is how people will be cleaning in the future, not using detergents at all. It begins as water, ends as water. They electrically charge it, and the water acts. It actually is a cleaning material, saves huge amounts of money, no cleaning, and they use 70% less water than they used with the detergents that they would use to clean with. This is an amazing, very, very exciting future that we have. Uh, our dollars are votes. Food choices are one of our three biggest environmental impacts that we make as consumers. Organic sales are going up dramatically. Here's an amazing story at McDonald's. They were considered, in Sweden, they were considered the third worst company environmentally. So bad Swedes were throwing rocks through their windows. As a result of that, 
McDonald's heard about the natural step and they began using it. They changed over to non-toxic cleaners. They got rid of styrofoam. They serve only organic milk, organic ice cream. They have veggie burgers. They have hamburgers with organic beef from local, locally grown. They're trying to have farmers convert to organic so they can have 100% organic hamburgers. Uh, at the same time, they ask you if you want a straw and a lid, which saves each store over $1,000 a year. They reduce their construction material use. They went from the third worst company environmentally to the third best company environmentally. So change can really happen if you really are smart in terms of how you go about it. Um, this has been one of my greatest friends and mentors, and I'm very sad that he is no longer with us, Ray Anderson, the founder of Interface, um, the world's largest commercial floor covering manufacturer in the world. He, um, uh, his story is an amazing story. I don't know, we probably don't have time, right? Well, you can ask. Do we have time for to just, Okay, so, because I want to be able to have time for, for more questions or comments. But Ray Anderson, an amazing, amazing guy. Somebody gave him the book, The Ecology of Commerce by Paul Hawken. He read the book, he said it was like someone put a spear in his chest. He realized that he and his company were single-handedly destroying the planet. That there was no hope or any future for his grandchildren unless he changed. But for him, he realized that his company, and here is a little background about his company, all petroleum-based company. And uh, petroleum to make nylon, fasten to PVC, dye water, had heavy metals and toxins, huge amounts of energy and carbon dioxide, old carpet and landfill, pretty horrible company. He said for us to change is like climbing Mount Everest. Really difficult kind of thing. And he had a lot of doubters at his company. But they made more than 400 sustainability initiatives. The first 100% recycled face fiber and backing carpet tile. Uh, the first solar powered carpet manufacturing plant in the world. Entropy, the first carpet tile based on biomimicry. Um, they were ISO 14000 certified, the first the first company to introduce a climate neutral uh, floor covering material. They, instead of using all these toxic glues, they had non-glue uh, non, yeah, non tactiles, little plastic pieces that went to the corners so they didn't have to use all this, saving huge amounts of money. But get this, their mission as a company is called Mission Zero. By 2020, their mission is to leave a zero environmental footprint on the planet. That's from a company that was this massive polluter. It's an incredible story. And they have saved, what's the result? They've saved $400 million since 1995. Their sales are up 49%. They had a 45% decrease in fossil fuel use, 69% uh, decrease in greenhouse gases, less water for carpet making, and they're one of the Fortune 100 top companies to work for. So you can do better by doing good in the world. And we have so many of these examples. So I really hope, and I'm happy to open up to questions and discussion, I really hope that you can see that we really can bring about a shift. I'm sorry I didn't get to talk about the third and especially the fourth of the principles, but maybe another time. So thank you very much and open to any discussion. <laughs> or questions. Yeah, so questions. So we'll start with you and then. Yes, I'm starting a nonprofit in Detroit, and I want to um, reuse the structure, make it zero carbon footprint um, when I renovate it, and then also make it a sustainable company. Um, what would be my first step? Uh, as far as the construction goes, I can handle that part, but make it, making it function as a zero um, sustainable company, how can I do that? Well, I'm happy to answer the question, but I, I would sort of love to have some, because we've got some people who actually are doing it day to day for a living. So any of you who've done presentations or in, sat in, want to make any comments? Want to make a comment on that? As far as where, where he'd begin, yeah. Where you start? Yeah. Where you, okay. Where you start the story, right? Yeah. Uh, I liked your presentation. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, if are you starting with your own building? It's, so I want to repurpose all kind of building. You want to, want to repurpose the building, which is great because that's a good start. Because now you now you have a foundation to start with. So, you know, how do you find a building like that? They're all over Detroit, obviously. 
and all over, you know, probably find one anywhere in the country that you like, you know, pick a location. And, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, with a Bryan construction, we do a lot of that. We take an old factory and turn it into an apartment building, multi, you know, multi-family. But, you know, you start with a good foundation, you use the existing steel, you use the existing concrete, you take out Obviously, the asbestos and the lead, and you have to do the abatement still on existing buildings. So you have to start to make it clean first. You just can't leave it with asbestos all over. So there's a lot to think about when you're doing that. So you do an environmental study first on the building you want to take. You know, maybe I agree, and I'm just curious, anybody else want to comment on that? Because, I mean, one of the things that I find is that there are certain builders, architectural firms, that are really committed to doing that. And I happen to have the privilege of getting to work with those. Usually you can find them in USGBC and, you know, US Green Building Council and that kind of thing. Because I think those who are committed to doing it and have a track record, they have contacts and ways of thinking that others don't have. In Minnesota, we have a reuse center, so you can get all kinds of materials um, so I don't know what that what it's like here you know in terms of being able to does that partially answer it or other comments anybody else wants to add yeah, yeah. We, have, you know, we do have reuse uh, you know if you look at warm training you know they teach people how to take buildings apart and reuse the materials out of them so for example we have a conference table in our building that's made out of old two by fours and two by sixes and the holes that were there for the Electrical wires are still there. We didn't fill them in. That's the kind of conference table I like. But did that help? Yeah, that's, that's, that helps with the structure. But what about um, when when the people get in the building and then making and then the second part of it is is, is how do I implement all those policies and and get everyone trained oh, and, and and get into the corporation you know get the nonprofit in a sustainable direction. Great, great. Excuse me, Terry. Yes. I wonder, yes. we um, have in the Green Expo um, time for a networking snack. And so I wonder if we can take this conversation over there and... Um, I do have one. I didn't get the gist of his question. I'll okay. add one little comment and then we'll okay. ask uh, All right. others. Great. Thanks, Julie. So, yeah. So what I find is that when we take people through a, a and have a shared framework, shared education about sustainability, it's transformational. And we have seen many, many examples, and they're very good studies that have been presented at AIA conferences where there can be a LEED certified building and it doesn't perform as, a, as well as a building that was never LEED certified, but the building occupants have gone through trainings and understandings about sustainability. So I think you're really right on with that piece. And I have found that the Natural Step Framework is an extremely powerful tool for having people get it. And it's not just like, oh, you know, you should save water or you should turn off light switches. It, like that. It's much larger larger in terms of its context about why it matters and how you can make a difference. And I gave you just a little bit of that feeling, but when you have more time, people really take it on. But the most important thing for me is that it's not top down. It's not what you have to do. You let them come and share. And I almost always find, for example, that People who everybody said, they're the naysayer. They can't stand these tree huggers and all that kind of stuff. When they're brought into this kind of context and they actually get to speak, they are the best proponents for sustainability. I love working with them. And I've just seen time after time, they become the real sustainability leaders. And they just started having liked all these tree hugger type people that have been telling them all the things that they need to do and you should and, and all that. But when it's coming from themselves, so that's why this bottom up process becomes so powerful and it brings about change really quickly. And I've actually had in Ohio one company I worked with, and we did it with actually all 120 of their employees. I actually had him cry. As he heard, we divide into teams, operational teams, and he's hearing from some of these teams that he always thought were laggards. And actually, they took it on. They really went for it. So I think that, that process becomes really powerful to engage everybody, and then they own it. So that, and then maybe creating a green team after that. So, because it's hard to keep it going without, and that's not a one-way green team, but a two-way where people are sharing how is this working and you know that kind of back and forth. Does that get more at it? Good. 
good. Other question. I, there was somebody I pointed to. Yeah. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, the mic. You can make your comment or your question. You made a good one earlier today. I would very, very much welcome you to take the Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper on top of your Mount Sustainability and then kindly have a conversation with him about the tar sands and the consequence of all that. Uh, and then we talk about Exxon uh, making $45 billion profit last year. Yeah. We're talking about eight out of the 10 leading Fortune 500 companies being oil and gas, 85% of present global energy supply from fossil. The task is tremendous. Is. You have beautiful examples of transformation, but the task that we have is incredible and unfortunately vested interest today. And now I'm coming back to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and all of the powers that actually are to be. Uh, I would hope that you have an opportunity on behalf of mankind to reach these people, but we do need to reach these people to change it and, and basically change the course on this planet. I, I agree with every word that you said, and, and I particularly appreciate, you know, before when you made some comments and these, I mean, your knowledge is amazing, and I hope that we are getting to tap that and, and use your energy. If you ask me what I would say, the most important thing that anybody can do, if we have very little energy, is to change the financing of political elections. It's the least sexy, least fun thing that most of us who care about the environment or animals or whatever our thing is, that's what we don't really want to do, that's the most important thing that we can do. Because until we change that system, you're going to have the Harpers or you're going to have whoever it is in Congress, you know, keep doing what they're doing. So we've got to change that system. It's really, really critical. Um, you're so right about the power of these big guys. There's no question. But, you know, it's an amazing thing. I think all of us, and I'm just getting chills down my spine as I say this, who would have thought that the Berlin Wall could fall? Who would have thought that we'd speak of the former Soviet Union? You know, <laughs> you're right, Reagan maybe. But I mean, the amounts of change, the people's popular uprising in the Philippines, getting rid of Marcos, I mean, these things are astounding, astounding. Gay rights things, I mean, just all kinds of changes that have been happening in our society. And, you know, they're not easy. But here's the thing, what distinguishes sustainability from all of those. This is a positive win, 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 win. And so I think that if we use our connections in the religious, spiritual world, that are very powerful. Every time I go to Washington, D.C., and I'm lobbying on behalf of the Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life or any other religious institution, every conservative, liberal, does not matter, congressman or senator that I speak to says, you're my favorite group. And they don't just say it to others because I've been there lobbying for, you know, as a business person. They love because that's something they can relate to. So I think that this is a conversation that is huge. It is why I wanted to come here, you know, to speak with you guys. And the part that I did not get to share with you about meeting fundamental needs. There is work by a guy named Manfred Moxneef, a Chilean economist, who got the alternative Nobel Prize for his work in what's called bottom-up, people-centered, sustainable development. He's known as the barefoot economist for his work in Latin America and Africa. Um, and I'd be happy, if you guys sign sheets, I'll be happy to send you some of the stuff that I've written about what he's done. But he's argued that there are four fundamental needs that every person has. Uh, ten fundamental needs every person has, but there are these four steps. And it's, it's really powerful. And when you get that, it is one of the most uplifting messages I've ever seen because it shows how we can overcome our consumer addiction, this disease called affluenza, consuming the planet to death and at the same time meet the fundamental needs of the poorest people on the planet and really have a life that's far more meaningful. I think that is a transformational, revolutionary message. And that is a message which is why I believe churches, synagogues, you know, all different religious institutions, it's at their core. 
but they've never realized it. And I think we can have that conversation. I think it can be transformative. I think it can bring up a bottom-up whole questioning of what our economic system is, what our political structure is. And, and so I show you the positive examples because I think people need to see that there are people bringing about change with big institutions, you know, a McDonald's or an interface. They're doing it and they are succeeding. So you need to know that, but you're right. Who has the power? I mean, we're seeing telecom, we're seeing, you know, the Googles, and, you know, and some of the things they do are good, but a lot of the things they're doing are really dangerous and really problematic. That's why we need to have this be a bottom-up kind of change and change the political system. So I, I don't know if that helped to get at it, but I, I hope it gave at least a little bit of, of why I feel we can bring about this kind of change. So other questions, comments? Yeah. Here, I'll come over because they, they want to tape you. You know, just looking at the dates on your examples, you know, 1990, 1995, this is 20 years old already. So this is not new, and people have been really focusing on this for a long time. Yeah. You know, I worked for General Motors for 38 years, mm -hmm. and I was on the energy conservation, first energy conservation program in 1973. And we save billions of dollars in energy costs. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and just when you say, you know, I appreciate it. when you say old. I mean, in 1979, I was working in the White House during the last energy crisis, and it was an amazing thing. I was part of the White House Emergency Energy Task Force, and we would meet every day to try to figure out how do we keep the country going, how to get fuel to the farmers and the truckers and everybody else, and. America responded in such an extraordinary way. We saved so much energy in our homes, and our schools, our congregations, uh, our communities. If we kept saving energy the way we were back then, we'd be importing zero foreign oil from the Persian Gulf, zero. And who was the leader in the world in renewable energy? Who was it? The U.S. We led the world. You got to know that. It's so important. We had solar panels on the White House. It's so important that we understand that when we join together and we say, this is what we want, we can lead. And that's what we need to do again. And we need to bring about some of these larger changes that, that some of you have talked about. But we have the capacity. We really do. And you think, you know, you mentioned about Ford. I mean. Can anybody imagine where Ford is today versus where it was? I mean, it's incredible. And who's the head of Ford? What does he believe in? You know, he's a total environmentalist, you know? So I think that these kinds of changes are happening and we need to speed them up and we need to change the political system to encourage it. But many businesses, many cities are leading the way to sustainability. I do a lot of work with cities all over the country and it's amazing to see what's going on in cities. Look at our congregations, look at our faith traditions to see what's going on at the national level. You know, I led a training for the leadership of all the major national Jewish institutions. They're all committed to sustainability. Yeah, they're all committed. And look at each one of the different faith traditions. It's amazing to see what's going on. Look at healthcare. Oh, I'm getting the, the time thing. But look at healthcare. Healthcare is doing extraordinary. So I think the changes are happening at such a fast pace, but we don't see them reported in the media, unfortunately. Tom Friedman likes to write about them in the New York Times, but other than that, I, and I agree with Tom Friedman about a lot of things. The one thing I do want to say is he says sustainability, well, he says one thing I agree with, sustainability is the new red, white, and blue. But the other thing he says, and he says it over and over again, which I totally disagree with, sustainability is hard. And he keeps saying it, and I've had arguments with him about it. He said, please don't keep saying it, because if you say it enough, people actually believe you, and it'll become hard. It is not hard. And I think, I hope some of the examples I've shown give you a sense of what we can do. So thank you all for doing what you're doing. Really appreciate it.